You sit in that rocking chair. You want to look back and say, I played full out for me first. So everybody's going to have fear. You're supposed to have fear, but you cannot have, you cannot have any doubt. You know tomorrow you're going to get 24 hours in the day. You know that. You know you're not gonna get 23. You know you won't get 25. So my question to you, sister, my question to you, brother, is when will you love you enough to give yourself just one of the 24? You don't run out of time. You simply allocated all your time to someone that you put in front of you. I'm going to follow it with this statement. I say it in love. You will always, as a leader, as a game changer, as a gladiator, you will always have a long line of people waiting to be served by you. You will always. People will knock down your door to get in your line. Here is my question. When will you put yourself at the front of your own line? And I say that because it took a doctor telling me, I was in Utah, my doctor called me on Zoom and said, you are morbidly obese, you're over 220 pounds, you, ha you have severe sleep apnea, and you travel over 258 days out the year. And when other people go to work to sit down to work, you go to work and get on stage and push out the little energy that you have from your sleep deprived body. Lisa, it's not a matter of if you're going to have a heart attack. It's a matter of when will you have it and where will you be? The doctor went on to say, will you be on stage in front of your audience? Will you be in the air on a plane? Will you be at home in front of your son, Jelani? Or will you be in a hotel room by yourself? I thought she was cruel. I thought she was cruel to make me have that kind of fear. And then she followed it with this. She said, the only reason why I'm saying this to you this way is because I've sat in your audience and I've experienced your gift. And I need to disrupt you enough to be radical. And so I, I'm not disrupting you or poking you for the sake of doing it. It's because someone is ready to be blessed by your gift. Someone is ready to be touched by your soul. Someone's ready. And until you handle the self-care, until you prioritize you, until you move to the front of your own line the way I had to do, you won't be able to give the world the all of you that you know you're to do. And my grandmother just transitioned. And my grandmother would say, baby, when you get my age, she was 92 years and, and, and nine months when she uh, transitioned, laid down to rest in peace. And she's resting in peace because she played full out. She said, baby, when you get my age, you're supposed to sit in your favorite rocking chair. And I bought granny a good rocking chair, y'all. And you're supposed to share the stories of your life. She said, but baby, when you're your age, you're supposed to do one thing, do everything in your power to make sure that the story is going to be good to share. You are protecting your future memories of yourself. Me being radical about my health, you getting radical about your health, you becoming non-negotiable about your health is about protecting your future memories about yourself. That when you sit in that rocking chair, you want to look back and say, I played full out for me first. And then I served everybody else from my overflow. That's your job. That every day, that's your job. Every day, that's your job. And allow us to witness and be the beneficiaries of you playing full out. I've talked to every person I've ever coached, from the business to the athletes, whoever it is. So do you have fear? I have fear all the time. They have fear all the time. Now, does that fear f makes freezes you in one spot? Does it paralyze you? Or does that fear propel you forward? That That's how you have to look at it. So this is what they do. They all have fear, but they don't have doubt. There's a huge difference between fear and doubt. Fear is instinctive. Fear is instinctive. All right. 
that's something that's telling you, hey, listen, if you if you don't have fear, whatever you're chasing, whatever your win is, whatever race you win, it's not big enough. It's it, it, it's not it's not big enough. Mm. All right. So we all fear is instinctive. All right. Doubt is something we bring on ourselves. And a lot of times the doubt we bring on ourselves is manifested through what other people tell us, through their thoughts, through their ideas, which we start, which we start to believe. All right. And the people that win take other people's doubts and they use them for energy. They, they don't hold on to them. It's just like a workout. It's like an, it's like an empty calorie. Hmm. It's like an empty calorie. It serves no purpose. You got to burn it off. You can use it, use it for fuel, and, and, and get and get rid of it. So everybody's going to have fear. You're supposed to have fear, but you cannot ha- you cannot have any doubt that this is going to do it. I'd rather have you fail at something and say, "I went after it," than not than be frozen by doubt and never given that and never go after that opportunity. And that's what most people do from a health standpoint. All right. Yeah, when you put them, when you give them a nutrition plan, when you tell them these are the things that you have to do, there's some fear in you. There's some wow. I got to give up this. I got to do this. I got it here. I here by my sleeping habits here. This is what's got to happen from a physical standpoint, mental. And you're like, man, can I do all this? Can I do all this? Can I do all this? But the ones that be like, you know what? Just like you said when your podcast sitting in Missouri, you had no doubt. You had no doubt. So we're we're gonna we're going to we're going to do this, and that's that's what you did. So things that people think are negative, the greatest athletes in the world have the fear. They have the fear. Michael Jordan used to tell me all the time. Every time I get out on the basketball court, yeah, there's a little bit of there's a fear of me not playing at my highest level, but I have no doubt on what the outcome is going to be. You know, he always says, he goes, I never lost a game in my life. I just ran out of time. I've always had some defiance inside of me. Um, and it really works out in my favor some of the time, um, not all the time. But um, in this particular situation, especially because even though my father is the greatest to um, you know, so many people and so respected and loved. I saw all of his mistakes. I'm aware of his downfalls. There's so many. And that really shaped the way I see the world, the way I see people. Mm. So you can be good at something. It doesn't mean you know everything. It doesn't mean you have all the answers for me. Yeah. And a lot of times we give our opinion based off of our own perception or our own life experience. Right. Mm-hmm. So I had to take that into consideration. Like I might ask him, you know, his opinion on one thing and listen, because I respect his opinion on it. I'm like, you know, yeah, he, he knows. Like, I'm going to come to you for nutrition advice. But you, I might not come to you for some other advice. Well, now, nah, Sean, you know, we, you know. But you just don't depends. come to me for surfing. I don't <laughs> for what surfing. OK, see <laughs> surfboard. So, I don't know nothing. about. Right. It. So for my father, um, you know, that defiance was there just kind of like. So the reason I can't do it is because I'm a woman. The reason I can't do it is because it's too hard. That right there is going to go in one ear and out the other. Now, if he would have said something to me that resonated and made sense and made me say, oh, OK, you know, maybe I would have I would have listened. But his reasoning just wasn't there. So and at the end of the day, I think to answer your question, I, I know how to go with my what's in my I know how to go with what's in my heart. Mm-hmm. See what I'm saying? So yeah. if I'm going to be wrong. I wanted to be wrong because of the decision I made off of following my own heart, not because I listened to someone else and then have regrets later. Like I'm not afraid to fail at something that I'm super passionate about, that I want really badly. If it doesn't work out, guess what? I'm gonna try something else. Mm. I'm gonna learn from that and I'm gonna move on, but I'm not gonna be so afraid to try something, right? Because I'm worried about failing. Mm. And not only that, if I can see all these other people doing it already, how are you gonna say I can't do it? You see what I mean? Yeah. So to me, it's not like I'm, well, I'm the first woman ever, you know, because I am the type of person that I'm very realistic and I don't necessarily 
want to be trying something that I'm not passionate about and not sure about. But I'm passionate about it. I want to do it. I've seen other people have done it before. Why wouldn't I be able to do it? So that's something I don't understand, like when people hold themselves back and it's like, you already see all these other people are doing it. Why can't you? Why? Mm -hmm. You know, you have to let your passion drive you because the only reason I wasn't going to be able to do it is if I wasn't willing to work hard, right? Because these women were working hard to try to knock my head off. Trust me, they didn't like it. They didn't like all the attention I was getting. Mm -hmm. Oh, Muhammad Ali's daughter, she's coming in here. She thinks she's going to get all the attention. She thinks she's just going to jump all ahead of us. And then people judge you by your looks. I do it. I see a pretty girl, I'm like, I'm gonna beat her ass. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because you just, you naturally, you can't help it. You naturally think they're not gonna be as tough. You yeah. naturally think that, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like subconscious, but I'm, I'm the same way. I'm just joking. I, I, I don't care if you're pretty or ugly. I wanna whoop your ass. <laughs> Get in the ring with just me. Just be clear. Just be clear. I was just joking. <laughs> but I know that people have that perception. Right. So I had to work 10 times harder than everybody else because everybody fought me 10 times harder. Yeah. And I was willing to do it because I wanted to be a champion so bad. So nothing was going to stop me, not even the greatest. Well, if you think about it, I mean, it's, it's really common sense. I mean, some of the research shows that, you know, 90% of the thoughts that we think on a daily basis are the same thoughts as the day before. So if you think that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, and 90% of your thoughts are the same known thoughts that you're always thinking, then your life should stay the same. Yeah. Because the same thoughts lead to the same choices. The same choices lead to the same behaviors. The same behaviors create the same experiences. The same experiences produce the same emotions. Those same emotions tend to influence the way we think. And our biology, our neurocircuitry, our neurochemistry, our hormones, and even our gene expression is equal to how we think, how we act, and how we feel. And how you think, how you act, and how you feel is called your personality. And your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. So then it makes sense then if you want to create a new personal reality, a new life, you're going to have to change your personality. And you got to start thinking about what you've been thinking about and change it. you got to become aware of your unconscious habits and behaviors, even how you speak. Then you have to look at the emotions that you live by every single day and decide, do these emotions belong in my future? So many people try to create a new life as the same person. Right. In order to create a new personal reality, you've got to change your personality. So the principle in neuroscience says that nerve cells that fire together wire together. Thinking the same way, making the same choices, demonstrating the same actions, creating the same experiences that stamp the same networks of neurons into the same patterns, all for the familiar feeling called you. And you do that for 10 years in a row. Well, you're going to hardwire your brain into a very finite sing signature because you're firing and wiring that way. And that box in the brain, that becomes our personality, becomes our identity. And by the time we're 35 years old, for the most part, we've done something so many times that the body now knows how to do it as well as the mind, and that's a habit. So we have these unconscious programs of, of behaviors, automatic habits, um, redundant emotional reactions, hardwired beliefs, perceptions, attitudes that function just like a computer program. You press go and it runs automatically. So then when it comes time to change, thinking positively is going to do nothing because your body has been conditioned for the most part into a program in the past. So the thought never makes it to the body because the body's on a different program. So how do we begin to influence the body so that the thought actually produces some type of change? So think about it. If you think an unhappy thought, you're going to feel unhappy. Yeah. If you think you're a failure, you're going to feel like a failure. Once you feel like a failure, you're going to think you're a failure. And people get caught in these loops of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking. And that redundancy is a conditioning process because all you need is an image or a picture or a thought and a feeling, a response, a stimulus response. And so the people tend to condition their brain and body into the past. And so when it comes time to change, you got to leave that familiar territory. And any choice that you make, if you said, hey, I'm going to eat a better diet, I'm going to wake up early and work out, I'm going to do meditation, the moment you decide to do something differently, get ready because it's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel unfamiliar. There's going to be some uncertainty. You're not going to be able to predict the next moment. That means you've left your known biology and you're stepping into the unknown. Now, theoretically, that sounds great, but 
If the body has been conditioned into a familiar feeling, it's in the known. The moment you take it outside the familiarity, it wants to go back to what's, where it's comfortable. So the body starts influencing the mind, and this is where people say, ah, oh, why don't you start your diet tomorrow? Ah, oh, why don't you start working out this evening? Uh, you're really never going to change. You know, you're too tired. You have a headache. You know, uh, this doesn't feel right. And this is where people talk themselves out of it because if they respond to that thought, that thought leads to the same choice, which leads to the same behavior, creates the same experience, produces the same feeling. And then they say, this feels right. No, that feels familiar. Mm. So going from one state of mind and body to another state of mind and body, you got to cross a river. And the hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before. Now, once people understand that they're going to be uncomfortable, then the question is, what thoughts do you want to fire and wire in your brain? What behaviors will you demonstrate in one day? And the act of closing your eyes and rehearsing who you're going to be when you open your eyes begins to install neurological hardware in your brain to look like you've already done it. Now the brain, which is typically a record of the past, now becomes a map to the future. And if you keep doing it, the hardware begins to become a software program and you start behaving differently. And then if you can teach your body emotionally what the future will feel like, that means then you're not going to wait for your wealth to feel abundant or your success to feel empowered or your new relationship to feel love. In fact, the moment you start feeling abundant, you're generating wealth. The moment you start embracing empowerment, you're stepping towards your success. The moment you're in love with yourself and you're in love with life, you start creating equals in your life. Now that's causing an effect in your life. So many people just, many people, they already know how to do this, but they usually wait for the worst thing to happen in their life before they get the wake-up call. When we're looking at a person's brain in real time, when they're going through some type of change or transformation, you see this massive amount of disorderliness going on in the brain, like the person is really losing their mind. All the circuitry is coming unglued. There's all this cognitive dissonance taking place. That's the moment they want to quit. That's the moment they want to give up. That's the moment they don't believe in anything and they believe in themselves. That is the prime moment where change takes place right there because that's the end. They're on the edge on the edge there. So it's important for people to understand that if you're going about living every single day in the familiar life that you're living in and you don't have a vision of the future, then you, you'll continue to live in routine. And if you wake up every morning and you do the same thing as you did the day before, over time your body's gonna be on autopilot. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna drag you into a predictable future based on what you did in the past. And many people lose their free will to a bunch of programs. Mm -hmm. So then <clears throat> when you sit down and you become conscious of your unconscious thoughts, when you're in the program, you're unconscious, right? So the moment you become conscious of that thought, you're no longer the thought. You're observing the thought and you begin to objectify your subjective self. You start pulling out of the unconscious program and consciousness, awareness is the first step to do that. And so many people don't want to light a match in a dark place because all of a sudden when they decide to be defined by a vision of the future, they're stepping out of the known. You're going to hear, I can't, it's too hard, it's not going to work, what about this? And those are the thoughts that are standing in the way between that person and that vision. And it has to come up. And if a person has been in the habit of unconsciously complaining and making excuses and feeling sorry for themselves and judging other people, that's their habit. The moment they become conscious of it, now, now they're out of the bleachers and they're, in, they're on the field, right? Because mm -hmm. now you have to not let that thought slip by your awareness unnoticed. And then if you're living in guilt or suffering or pain or unhappiness, but you live that way every day and it just feels like you and all of a sudden you become aware. Oh my God, I've been guilty for the last 10 years. I didn't even know it. It just mm -hmm. felt like me. You're starting to separate yourself from your biology. And so you have to go through the process of unlearning before you relearn. And that 95% of who we are, that is what's stopping us from stepping into a new future. So then if people then are waking up every single day, you know, think about this, the brain is a record of the past. If you wake up every morning and you start thinking about your problems and your problems are just memories that are etched in your brain that are connected to certain people and problems and certain objects and things in certain times and places, the moment you start remembering your problems, you're thinking in the past, right? Yeah. 
And if every one of those problems has an emotion associated with it, and you start feeling bad or unhappy, now your body's in the past. So thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of your body. And how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. So most people then, they start their day in the familiar past. Then they get up and they run through a routine series of behaviors and their body's now habituated on autopilot into a predictable future. That's the known. So the familiar past, the predictable future are both the known. There's only one place where the unknown exists and that's the present moment. Mm. So then when you're creative, you gotta be present. You gotta pay attention to be creative and that, that defies or it goes against the programming. And so then there's this, there has to be some type of waging of intention that's greater than those programs. And most people, they get uncomfortable. They'd rather just get on their cell phone or you know, turn on the TV and watch a football game or distract themselves from that feeling. But when people really make up their mind to change, they have to come up against those feelings, those habits, those hardwired attitudes. And, and it takes a great act of will. But when we do it, the side effect is we see changes not only in our health, but in our lives as well. And then we say, wow, that really worked. And now we're the example of truth. That's what makes it so cool. I mean, adversity is fuel, right? If you think about something so simple, if you look at the news, what is the thing that gets people talking? The negative, like only the bad stuff. Things that empower people, like here's something very empowering that you can do to really get through 2020. If the news is all that, nobody be talking. Mm, come on. Right? They, nobody say, I understand we gotta, I understand we gotta know what's going on, but they don't have the, you know, I've actually pitched myself to be on a specific, specific show to be like, okay, let's have the powerful moment at the end of the show so that people can thrive. No, when people watch uh, TV, reality TV, the highest rating shows, when you see that there's a fight on Bravo on one of the shows, it's like, oh girl, did you watch that? You know what I mean? Like, what are the, th these are the things that are getting the most energy, the most fuel, social media. You know, Sean, you've been through it. When you post something like, People want to take what you say and they want to, they want to create the adversity because they want the karma. They want that fire. You know, they want it. But what people are not doing is within their own adversity, with their own struggle, within their own, you know, challenging times, they don't want to work as hard to push themselves forward as much as they want to work hard. To, to dig into the other adversity and to dig into the fighting and stuff that's going out in the world. And so what I like to say is, and we've all been guilty of it. We've all probably commented on something that we didn't want to. And we're like, oh my gosh, like this is negative. I don't want to get involved in it. But then you're like, oh, you know, that rage wins. But imagine if you took that same energy to yourself when you're going through your own struggle and you say, instead of me giving it to people on social media, instead of me entertaining this negative stuff that's happening on the news, what if I'm able to change myself? What if I'm able to help enhance myself? And so that's how you get to a point where you can love yourself and just kind of really quick going back to just the fitness thing in general, the people who really love themselves more and, and really commit to themselves and are very present and aware of where they are in their life. That's what health really is. Yes, we, we have to eat healthy. And of course, you have to work out. But that's when I get back to the mental state. Because you have to be aware, you have to be present, and you have to be willing to do the work to constantly lift you forward. Our daily rituals determine our results, how we feel, what we think, what we focus on, uh, and ultimately our quality of life. And the the Miracle Morning, the premise of it is, is, is around a very simple concept, or it's around a couple, right? The first one is that Jim Rohn philosophy I shared earlier, which is your level of success won't exceed your level of personal development, right? And, and the way I would flip that is the other side of the coin and the way of saying that is your level of success will parallel your level of personal development. So in other words, our society has conditioned us to think that if you want to achieve more, you have to do more. And while that is a strategy, 
What I found is that the, 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 the more true, more effective, more lasting strategy is that the real secret to achieving more isn't doing more, it's becoming more, right? Doing more will give you short-term benefits, short-term results. Becoming more will give you long-term lasting results. And you can often achieve more by doing even less. As you become more effective through your personal development, more uh, efficient through your personal development, you can achieve more by doing even less. So that's the first premise. The second is that how you start your day sets the tone, the context, and the direction for the day that you live thereafter. And, and, and a simple way to put that is if you win the morning, you win the day, right? Or you put yourself in a position to win the day. Um, one of the gentlemen in, featured in the Miracle Morning movie, Brian Johnson, founder of Optimize, he said that uh, you know your day is your life in miniature, right? And that the way you create an extraordinary life is you put together, you string together many extraordinary days, and all of those days start with the morning, right? So most people, they have I would you know no offense to anybody, but you know at least for me it used to be a mediocre morning where I slept until the last possible minute. I usually hit the snooze button a few times, right? Which if you think about that, that doesn't even make sense. You know, you're saying like I want an extraordinary life but I'd rather lay here unconscious for nine more minutes, right? And, then, and do that a few times. And then if you, and you're also, you wake up and it's literally, you're resisting life itself. You're going, oh, I got to get out of bed. I don't want to get out of bed. Versus waking up, not when you have to, but waking up because you want to, right? It doesn't have to be an hour. It could be 30 minutes. Most people do an hour long miracle morning, about 82%. Uh, like 15% or so do a 30 minute miracle morning and the last few percent do less than that, like 15 minutes. Um, but either way, it's completely scalable. You know, you can do, there's a chapter in the book called the six minute miracle morning. So you can really do whatever you want. So that's the premise is how you start your day sets the tone, the context, the direction for how you live your day. And if you have a goal oriented, growth oriented, focused, purpose driven morning, right? You become the best version of yourself and then you bring the best version of yourself into everything that you touch throughout the day. <clears throat> the one thing to consider is right now, and this is true in life, but especially now, whenever we're stressed out, we tend to go to bed thinking stressful thoughts and then consider that your first thought in the morning is almost always the same as the last thought you had before bed. So if you went to bed thinking stressful thoughts, not only do you marinate on those throughout the night while you're sleeping, your subconscious work goes to work on those stressful thoughts and, and you know continues to soak them into your nervous system. But when you wake up in the first thing in the morning, your first thought is usually, oh, right, whatever you were thinking before bed. And, and flip that over. Think about like for me, Sean, like what, what's the most exciting time for you throughout your lifetime? When is the most exciting time for you to wake up in the morning, like vacation or Christmas or like what is it for you? For me now, I mean, it's daily, but back in the day, it was definitely Christmas day. That would be, that's that vibe. I love that. Cause I think for most of us, right. Especially if you're, when you're a kid, if you celebrated Christmas, you couldn't wait to wake up. And so you think about it. The last thing you were thinking about before you went to bed is it's Christmas. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. And you probably didn't even sleep that well because you were so freaking excited. You could toss and turn and you couldn't fall asleep. But as soon as the, your eyes shot open in the morning, you, you were like, it's Christmas and you were excited and you were energized and it didn't matter how many hours of sleep you got or the quality of the sleep, you were intentional before bed about what you were thinking about. You created your experience in the morning before you fell asleep and then you manifested it. You lived it first thing in the morning and you're on fire, you're energized, you're excited, you're happy, et cetera. And one of the things I've realized with the miracle morning is that you can, like you said, every day, you can recreate that experience intentionally every single day. You know, if you think about our thoughts, so we might have thoughts like, um, I just can't take it anymore, this is ridiculous. We might have emotions. Emotions might be things like loneliness, stress, discomfort, anger, frustration, you know, the full range of emotions that we're experiencing. And then we've got stories. I mean, some of our stories were written on our mental chalkboards when we were five years old. Stories about who we are, what kind of people we are, what kind of life we deserve, what kind of love we deserve. And the way we deal with our thoughts, emotions, and stories drives everything. It's critical to how we love, how we live, how we parent, how we lead, and indeed how we deal with a pandemic. 
So what you talk about, which is so critical, is that one of the narratives that we have in society is that we've got to be positive, that even in the shadow of illness and death, that we've got to be happy, looking for silver linings, grateful, you know, all of these narratives that we have. And what I really do in my work is push very strongly against this idea that we've just got to be positive. And there are a couple of reasons for this. The first is that when you are experiencing difficult emotions and you try to force positivity, what you're basically doing is you're not living in the world as it is. You're living in the world as you wish it would be. And if you are feeling something that's difficult right now, that is what you are feeling right now. And trying to pretend otherwise is not actually dealing with the reality. And you might say, well, what difference does it make? Well, it makes a couple of uh, really, really important differences in terms of our well-being. Uh, the first is that we know that people who pretend to be happy or try to be happy or try to be positive what actually happens is they are very often doing something which is called emotion suppression. Uh, what this means is that they're feeling upset or lonely and they're saying, well, you know, at least I've got a job, I should be happy. Or at least, you know, at, at least I've, I should be happy. And so they're pushing these difficult emotions aside. And we know that when we suppress our emotions in an ongoing way, actually what it does is it is predictive of higher levels of depression, higher levels of anxiety. A second reason why we don't want to just force positivity is that when we do this, it's denial, it's avoidant. And so we are not then actually developing skills that help us to say, gee, what I'm struggling with is this, and this is how I need to navigate the situation. So you're not actually in a situation where you then are able to come up with solutions and strategies to what it is you're facing. So those are some of the reasons why forced positivity is so destructive. Um, but we know that people over time who try to just put on happy actually become less happy, that there is a real decrement in terms of people's capacity. And Sean, just by the way, this is not only in terms of oneself. We know that when people try to force others into happiness, actually what it does is it is uh, detrimental to the relationship. It's detrimental to how we develop skills in our children. And even if you're a manager or a leader, we know that when managers and leaders try to push aside the difficult emotions of their team, when they say things like, oh, let's just be optimistic, let's just get on with it, Actually, what's so fascinating is the team's blood pressure increases. The team doesn't even know that the manager is doing this, but they actually have this uh, physiological effect. And really what this does is it leads one to experience others when there is this suppressed emotion as being false, inauthentic, and difficult to actually relate to. And so it's no surprise then that forced positivity, as I've already mentioned, impacts on people's well-being, but it also actually impacts on people's relationships as well as their capacity to actually achieve their goals because it is avoidant. Ooh, this is so good. So we tend to, in our culture, force positivity upon ourselves and force it on other people. Just cheer up. Don't worry. Be happy. Get over it. And we're not... Use, using the vital and valuable information, the, the feedback that our emotions are giving us. This is profoundly important. Everywhere we go on social media, it seems like people are telling us to find silver linings, just be positive. And the opposite of that is if you somehow aren't positive, you're bringing me down, you're toxic, and therefore I need to do away with you. You know, that is the messaging that is in our society. And really what I want to promote is that this idea, we think that we are being positive and happy and that it's actually helping us to be more resilient and more successful. But actually what we know is that it actually lowers resilience. And I don't just mean this in us as individuals or us in relationships. I really mean 
us as a society, when we cannot go to difficult emotions, when we can't learn from difficult emotions, we fail to actually develop skills to navigate a simple truth. And the simple truth is that there is pain in the world and there is difficulty in the world. And when we just force positivity, we are bypassing that reality and therefore we aren't actually able to show up to ourselves and others. And Sean, you know, what you point out is this really important aspect of why. And Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin first described that emotions are functional, that emotions help us to communicate with others, but also with ourselves. And so when we push aside our difficult emotions, we struggle to develop skills that help us to adapt and therefore thrive in the world because our emotions are critically important in helping us to adapt. And if there was ever a time that we needed to adapt, it's now, you know, it's in the shadow of uncertainty. So if we think about these difficult emotions, uh, what we know is that these difficult emotions, thoughts and stories are normal, as I've already described. You know, we have around, for instance, 16,000 spoken thoughts every single day. And so many more course through our minds. You know, am I good enough? Is my job okay? Am I going to be safe? We've got all of this. There is nothing inherently good or bad about a thought, an emotion, or a story. In fact, it is the opposite. These thoughts, emotions, and stories are helping us to make sense of our world, helping us to understand what we need to do. So, Let's do away with hustling with whether we should or shouldn't have them. But of course, Sean, as you talk about what can sometimes happen is we can sometimes start engaging with these thoughts, emotion stories in ways that are destructive. And so what I found in my work and what I talk about in my TED talk is that often when people have them, they tend to do one of two things. The first is what I call bottling. Bottling is where you push aside the difficult emotions. You say things like, I shouldn't have them, or what we spoke about, I've just got to be happy. I've just got to look for silver linings. Or, you know, sometimes even with good intentions, I'm just going to ignore it because I just got to get on with everything that I'm trying to get on with. So bottling is where you try to push these aside. Brooding is where you get stuck inside the thought emotion story, you get victimized by it. I'm so angry. I'm so upset. Why, you know, every time I think life is going my way, you know, now everything happens and it's not effective. So we know that both bottling and brooding don't serve us. They are both actually forms of rigidity. When we bottle our difficult emotions, we are using one way of being with those. Uh, we often getting distracted. We're getting lost on Netflix. We're pushing them aside, but it's a form of rigidity. Uh, brooding is also a form of rigidity. It's getting stuck in that difficult feeling. So there are a couple of things that are really important. The first is, and, and you've already alluded to this, that our emotions contain incredibly valuable data. Our emotions contain signposts of things that matter to us. So let me give you some examples of what I mean here. Imagine you have got a piece of paper and you're listening to this podcast right now and you think about some of the emotions that you have been feeling of late and you imagine writing this emotion on the piece of paper. And that emotion might be lonely, it might be fear, grief, um, anxiety, frustration, anger, rage, whatever that emotion is, or even joy, you know, whatever that emotion is for you, boredom. Okay, so now turn that piece of paper over. What most people would say in the forced positivity brigade is think of something now that you're grateful for. What I'm going to do is I'm going to invite something opposite, which is ask yourself, what is the difficult emotion signposting for you? What is it telling you about your values and your needs? So loneliness might be signposting that even in 
a room full of people, even when you are locked indoors with your family, that you can be lonely. We can be lonely in a crowd. We can be lonely on Zoom calls 24-7. So loneliness might be signposting that you need more intimacy and connection and that you don't have enough of it right now. Grief, grief is love looking for a home. Grief is often signposting that you have some sense of memory, of a person, of a place, of something that was important, and it's reminding you of what it was that was offered by that person or the place and inviting you to be in communion with that thing that is important. If you're feeling frustration, that frustration might be signposting that you need more time and space for yourself, that actually you are depleted. And the value that you might be writing on that piece of paper is self-care. So when we push aside our difficult emotions, then we aren't actually becoming adaptive to the world as it is. And yet when we just face into that difficult emotion with curiosity, the first part of emotional agility that I mentioned earlier. And we say, what is this emotion signaling that is important to me? We are now stepping into a place of power and understanding and learning. Some of the other examples, Sean, is, you know, boredom might be signposting that you value learning and growth and you don't have enough of it. Guilt as a parent might be signposting that you value presence with your children and that you have spent so much time nowadays making sure that they're on their homeschooling Zoom call, but you are yearning for that presence with them. So slow down into your emotions. Don't race for the emotional exits. Instead, ask yourself, what are these emotions signposting? Because fundamentally, our emotions are data. Most people live their life from a place of being a victim. We believe that our world would be better if it wasn't for our parents who were alcoholics or it wasn't for the government or it wasn't for who's president or the do-nothing Congress or, you know, all these things we blame. We blame the traffic for making us late. You know, we live in L.A. or I live 90 minutes north and you live down here. And the reality is people are always complaining about the traffic made them late. And it's the same people day after day. It's called like leave earlier. <laughs> this, this is what the it's, traffic it's gonna is. It's going to be you know? there. <laughs> and so I, I have this wonderful formula that I was taught by a psychotherapist probably 35 years ago called E plus R equals O. Events plus response equals outcome. And most people, when they don't get the outcomes they want, instead of changing their response to the events of the world, they blame the event right. instead of changing their response. So two plus two is always going to equal four. And if you wanted a five in life, you're going to have to do a three instead of a two. And then what happens when you have something like an a, a economic crisis or the, the coronavirus thing going on? All of a sudden, the world's doing a one. You can do your two, which you were doing, which was working really well, but one plus two now equals three. Yeah. So you're going to have to up your game and do something different. And so what I've attempted to do is, well, I've actually achieved it, is I've interviewed probably 150 to 200 of the most successful people in the world in every walk of life from entertainment, sports, government, military, whatever, and said, what are those responses of the successful people? What are the thoughts that successful people think? What are the behaviors and habits of success, highly successful people? And we can learn those. They're all learnable. You know, I wasn't born any more brilliant than anyone else. I just happened to learn some principles and apply them. Yeah. And so let's take responsibility, give up blaming, give up complaining, and give up excuse making. Those are the three things that people do. I like to say, you know, that uh, when you're com blaming things or complaining about things, you know, that people, have you ever heard anyone complain about gravity? You, <laughs> you never hear anyone complain about gravity. Gravity's you, holding me down. Yeah. And yet you see all these old people with their, their walkers, they're all bent over, but they're never going, I hate gravity, gravity sucks. <laughs> One for gravity, I wouldn't be all bent over. And the reason they don't yeah. do that is there's no option. Right. So we don't complain about things where there is no option. We only complain about things where there's something can be different. 
So, like, if, if I complain about my wife, call her the food Nazi. You know, she's like, oh, you shouldn't be eating that. You shouldn't be watching that football game. They're making, you're getting all healthy. You're sitting here having Cheetos and a beer, you know, whatever. I don't do that, actually. But you get the idea. <laughs> and so the, the, I could say my wife's a pain in the butt. Now, I have a choice. I could either say to my wife, this is my body. You take care of your body. I'll take care of mine. Or I could go look for the perfect wife who goes, honey, do you want more Cheetos? Can I get you another beer? Because that woman exists. And I couldn't complain about my wife if I didn't have that image of another possibility. Mm -hmm. So people are only complaining because they know something better exists. They see people that are happier, healthier, have more money, are taking more vacations, going to places they want to go, et cetera, have better relationships with their kids. And so it's only that that allows us to complain. So whenever someone's complaining, the only question I ask them is, what would you prefer and what would you be willing to do to get it? Mm. And that's really get off that. My staff comes to me with a complaint. It's called, what do you want? What could you do to make it happen? Maybe there's something I could do to help. No complaining. In my company and in my seminars, if you were to come, we have these two big fish bowls. And if you complain, $10 fine. If you're late to work, $10 fine. You make an excuse about why you didn't get something done when you agreed to do it, $10 fine. You blame somebody, the printer didn't do it on time. Well, you didn't bring it to them early enough to, you know, $10 fine. So it's really critical to take 100% responsibility. And notice it doesn't say 99%. Because mm. I always ask people in my audience, I say, how many of you would like to be married to someone who is 99% committed to monogamy? <laughs> right. Because you know that there's always that little out. Right. And so you have to be, there's no outs. It's just called 100% commitment. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here to optimize your mindset and to achieve your goals faster. People say to me, well, why do you do your meditations in the morning? I always say, easy. Because if I can overcome myself at the beginning of the day, the rest of the day is easy. That's the biggest mastery, right, Absolutely. is the self.